It's a huge pleasure to be back at Aspen. I haven't been here for m many years, and coming here reminds me um, that I should come here more often because it is so beautiful, uh, and, and everyone has been so nice. Um, look, I, I, you know, one doesn't know where to begin with all this. It's been such a crazy, bizarre, historically unprecedented uh, last year. You know, that one doesn't know where to begin. You know, you think about presidential campaigns and the early presidencies, and you ask yourself, you know, what, what will people remember? Well, historically, the interesting thing is what people remember are the words, is the rhetoric. You know, we still remember Franklin Roosevelt saying, you have nothing to fear but fear itself. We still remember John F. Kennedy standing on the steps of the Capitol and saying, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. So what will we remember from this last year, <laughs> right? Will it be the moment that Marco Rubio told Donald Trump he had a small penis? <laughs> this, this actually happened. You cannot, unf you cannot, we can't take that away. It did happen. Um, will it be the moment that Trump rose in sheer indignation, not because he thought that this was demeaning of the process of choosing the president of the United States, but because he said it was factually inaccurate? Um, one of... Donald Trump's many claims that cannot be independently verified, right? I'm, I'm not saying it's false or true. I'm just saying it's very hard to independently verify these things. Um, but I think that, to me, jokes aside, the most um, sad thing about this last year has been to see the, um, the, the loss of optimism uh, in, in the United States. You know, when you see a country that is uh, lost its interest in the future, is fixated in, in the past. Um, that's, that's often a very bad sign. You know, Thomas Mann wrote about, this, about Germany in the 1920s, uh, that if you start thinking about you know, returning to some Garden of Eden, which never was, you know, it, that, that, begins to, uh, that begins to worry you at a very deep level. And it worries me at a personal level, because I'm an immigrant. And I, you know, I came to this country in the 1980s, and I grew up in India in the 1960s and 70s, very poor country, uh, closed off from the world, and we would look up to America as this kind of beacon of hope and, and uh, progress. It was really, you know, we thought it was the country that was inventing the future. Uh, we probably lo you know, looked at California specifically as the place inventing the future. Every wacko trend in the world seemed to come out of, can uh, out of uh, California, but then it would become something that everybody did. You know, like whoever thought any anybody would be eating kale, and I just had a kale salad on my way, <laughs> on my way here. Um, so, you know, what I remember about about those days was we we had very little information about America. There was just this sense of it as the future. Um, India was very poor. As I say, we had uh, one, one television channel, black and white, uh, mostly government programs about the glories of Indian agriculture, so nobody watched. And then on Sundays, we'd get one Bollywood movie, and before it, this shows you just how poor India was, we would get the one piece of imported entertainment that the Indian TV uh, could, uh, could afford, which was, uh, in 1978, re reruns of I Love Lucy, um, <laughs> which is a show, I, of, co of course, I fell in love with. Uh, but then you begin to start have the, the, the technological revolutions that start sort of connecting the world. For me, it was the first one was the videotape revolution, uh, the Betamax revolution. Uh, if you say this to my kids, they think you know, I'm talking about sort of prehistory of some kind or the other. But it was really true, which was that for the first time, you were able to get a sense of what was going on in America right then and there. Because what would happen is there'd be some Indian family in Edison, New Jersey, that would tape their favorite television show, and they would send it home. And then that copy, that Betamax cassette, was passed around from family to family in places like Bombay and Delhi and Calcutta, like the, you know, the Soviet dissidents used to pass Samizdat uh, dissident literature, you know, copies of Orwell's 1984. We would pass these around. And, and that's how I got a feel for what America really was like, uh, at least what the television version of America was like. And every immigrant, I think, has uh, his or her version of an American dream, the thing that attracted them to America, that made them think of America as the, as the, uh, the city on the hill or the shining hope. For me, it was the opening credits to Dallas, the CBS miniseries. <laughs> I don't know if you remember it. 
It's this spectacular montage of gleaming skyscrapers, helicopters getting, you know, landing on rooftops, uh, uh, Cadillacs, men coming out of them with these, you know, 10-gallon hats and these, you know, huge coats. And the women, of course, um, yeah. Victoria Principle was definitely part of my American dream. Um, <laughs> and, and yes, it was a bit crass, it was a bit vulgar, but what it said about America was energy, dynamism, hope, optimism, this sense of the future. And that's always been the thing that people from the rest of the world have looked to America for, the sense that America believes in the future. Ronald Reagan had a great line once when he said, we don't care about your, your origins, we care about your destination. And I think that's the way that most people look at America, as a place that really cares about where are you going to go, not where did you come from. And to me, looking at that world, what's striking is how much has gone America's way since then, right? When I, was, when I came to, to the United States, People told me, oh my God, this country is battered by Vietnam, by Watergate. The Soviet Union is winning the Cold War. If you remember, this was a time when you had stagflation, you had the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. You were only a few years away from the incredibly humiliating resignation of Richard Nixon, the Iran hostage uh, crisis. And yet, within three or four years, what became absolutely clear was that the United States was coming back to life was reasserting its extraordinary economic resilience, and that by the end of the 1980s, it was clear it was not the United States that was in any kind of crisis, but it was the Soviet Union that was in a permanent structural crisis, and by 1991, there was no Soviet Union. And then you began this extraordinary uh, uh, new phase of, of uh, international life that really the United States ushered in. You know, when I was growing up in India, there was a very clear sense. There was the world of the United States and its allies, and that was free and rich and prosperous. Um, and it was only about 15 countries. It was the United States, Western Europe, Canada, a few countries in East Asia. The rest of the world was all, in some way or the other, locked behind high protectionist barriers, walls, isolated. And what happens in the early 1990s is the walls come down. And all of a sudden, the whole world is now participating in this American-built project. Uh, to try and create a single global economy, to try and create a rules-based international system where everyone is in some way somewhat cognizant of international rules and norms, where collective problems, uh, acid rain, are dealt with collectively so that you have some win-win solution for everybody. All this is happening at a time when the United States is surging ahead economically, surging ahead technologically. And so you have this extraordinary twin engines of globalization and information revolution that are powering the world and connecting it and combining it. It's difficult to remember how, uh, how, how strange this all was. You know, if you look back in the 1980s, uh, most currencies were not convertible. Capital couldn't move from country to country. You, you needed visas to go to any place in the world. Most, most people couldn't buy or sell source or supply from, uh, from suppliers outside their own country. Today, you go into a college dorm room, and some kid is, starting out, you know, is, is setting up a startup, and he's sourcing his products from Bangladesh, and he's selling them to, to China. And that's the transformation in one generation of this world. And then you had this information revolution which is really extraordinary. It's difficult to, again, remember how different it is. Uh, we all know about the economic effects of, uh, of it, the technological effects of it. You live with it all. Let me just give you one sense of how powerful it is. So the cell phones that you all have in your pockets that some of you are furtively looking at while pretending to listen to me, um, <laughs> those cell phones have more computing power than NASA had when it put man on a moon and back, times 100. When, when I came to the United States, there were three supercomputers, the most powerful computers in the world. Two were owned by the US government, one was owned by IBM. If you have an iPhone 7 or a Samsung 7, it is more powerful than the Cray supercomputers. And think about it, what you do with it is you chat, you stream stuff on Netflix, um, and you watch, you watch cat videos on YouTube, right? That's, that is what you are using, this incredible supercomputer that is in your pocket. But that is the nature of the information revolution that we've gone through, right? And it's only getting, getting stronger and more powerful. And these two forces act together. 
because one created this single global system, and the other is now binding it together. And it has all kinds of, imp of larger non-economic implications. Let me give you one example. In 1990, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. You remember this. And when he invades Kuwait, um, the most important issue at, the, at, at that time is, in those moments, was, is he going to go into Saudi Arabia? Because the Saudis were paranoid, because the feeling was, if he's invaded Kuwait for the oil, the mother load is in Saudi Arabia, and all he has to do is have these tanks keep driving through, and they will get to the mother load. The Saudis now have a big decision to make, which is, do they allow the Americans in to defend them? There's no chance they could defend themselves. So do they do that? But that has implications for this very conservative, very religious society with a crazy religious establishment that is deeply anti-American. And the king of Saudi Arabia is 85 years old. So conservative country, old king. By the way, the king of Saudi Arabia is always 85 years old, <laughs> in case you're. It's, it's sort of like they have, this, uh, they have this snail space succession in which it used to be that when you died, your next oldest brother became king. And at that point, there were 66 of them waiting in line. So by the time it got to be your turn, you were 85. The, the, the current king, by the way, is the last of that breed. He's a youthful 81. Um, but he has, by, he has completely bypassed succession and has, has appointed his uh, very, very young uh, son, who will be the next king of Saudi Arabia. Um, but the king decides, OK, let me think about this. I, do, I, don't, I don't want to make a hasty decision. Give me a week. And for that week, let's not tell anyone in Saudi Arabia that Iraq invaded Kuwait. That is, that our next door country was just invaded by another country. And this, it was a state secret for a week in Saudi Arabia, and it held. Now think about the world today, right? This was a world before you had CNN and Al Jazeera broadcasting that you didn't have websites, you didn't have cell phones. How long could you keep a state secret like that, in, even in Saudi Arabia, right? Like two minutes? Somebody in, in Kuwait would tweet, I'm being invaded, <laughs> right? And that would be the end of the Saudi state secret. It's important to remember how powerful this is because control of information, control of information has been one of the central powers that governments have had. So if you looked in the 1920s when somebody wanted to take over a country, what they would do is they would take over the, the presidential palace, either kill or arrest the president, and then they would take over the radio station because you wanted the source of political power and you wanted the source of information. 1960s, you would take over the presidential palace and you take over the TV station. Same logic. Well, what would you do today? You take over the presidential palace, but then what? What is the source of information in society? Because we've gone from a one-to-many broadcast system to a many-to-many -many network. And you saw this operate in real time a year and a half ago in Turkey. There was an attempted coup in Turkey. So the guys, the, this, this rump faction of the army, tries to first go after the president. He's vacationing, so they go to get him at his, at his vacation home. They kind of botch that. So you know, step number one doesn't go very well. The guy sort of escapes. But step number two, they think, OK, we're going to go after the, uh, the source of information, which in a charming way, they thought must be the American station, CNN. So they went after our affiliate in, in, uh, in Turkey, CNN Turk. They shut it down and made it broadcast pro-coup uh, propaganda. But of course, there were other things going on. But much more importantly, the president, Erdogan, was able to escape to an airport somewhere. And in the lounge of the airport, he takes out his iPhone, and he starts recording a message, which he then broadcasts on Facebook. And it then broadcasts on Facebook across the country, telling people, this is a coup, resist it, organize against it. They do, the coup fails. So here you have a perfect example of how a many-to-many -many network system does not allow for that kind of crucial power that the state had always had that ability to control information and control the narrative. And that reality of these two great forces, globalization pushing in one direction, the information revolution pushing in another, meant that American companies, which were masters of both, were dominating the world. You know, so if you look at the world today and you look at Facebook, Amazon, Google, uh, it's just extraordinary the degree to which American companies dominate the leading technologies of the world. There's never anything like it in history. If you'd gone back to the 1970s and said, what are the major uh, uh, countries dominating the, the next 
generation of technology. You'd have talked about America, of course, but you'd have talked about Germany, you'd have talked about Japan, you'd have probably talked about Holland, which had big companies like Philips. You know, in those days, consumer electronics was cut the cutting edge. Today, there's nothing but the United States. It's extraordinary. And in that world, you have had the United States be able to be demographically vibrant in a way that rich countries are not. This is the extraordinary hidden secret that America has had for the last 20 or 30 years. If you look at America's per capita GDP growth, that is income growth per individual over the last 20 years, and you ask me, who, who grew faster, Japan, the US, or Europe? The answer is they all grew the same. In other words, the advantage America has is that it has more people. And so it grows, it, it, its economy has grown more. On a poor person basis, we have not grown that much faster. Now, if you look at the rest of the world, the rest of the industrialized world, they're in bad shape demographically. I mean, Italy, for example, is within three to five years going to look like Florida. Now, I should hasten to add, I don't mean this aesthetically. The Italians <laughs> would be horrified at the prospect that they were going to, they were going to look like Florida. I, I think they would, they would commit, you know, whatever the Italian version of Harakiri is. Um, no, I mean demographically, it will look like Florida. And you can't sustain an economy on the basis of, you know, as a retirement state. You need young people, you need young workers, you need them not simply because they work and pay taxes and sustain the, the social security and, uh, and, and health benefits. You also need them because they're the ones who start companies, who invent stuff. Um, there's an interesting statistic I saw the other day. When you looked at the Nobel Prizes awarded in science over the last 100 years, 90% of the Nobel Prizes awarded in science were given to people for work they did before they were 45. 80% of them were before they were 40. That's when you do stuff. That's when you question authority. That's when you question hierarchy. That's when you are brave enough to risk everything. You know, not when you've got a, a wife, two kids, a mortgage, uh, and a, a settling down. And so that's the power that the United States has. So what went wrong? Right? What happened? How did we get to, to where we are? Well, let me tell you another story about the United States around that time, which is it's a story of American recessions and recoveries. If I had a black, uh, some kind of PowerPoint, I'd put it up. Um, but a friend of mine who's in the military who does a lot of these kinds of talks said to me, please promise me one thing. Never have a PowerPoint presentation, because he said people who have PowerPoint presentations never have any power and rarely have a point. <laughs> so I thought, all right. I, I'm, so keep that in mind as you, as you sa sample your wares and, at Aspen. Um, so the, the, the simple statistic is this. The United States since 1945, since the end of World War II, has gone through re recessions and recoveries. And every time, the pattern has been something like this. You go through the recession, and then the, the economy comes back out of the recession. And six months later, the jobs come back. From 1945 to 1990, that was the pattern. There was a six-month delay. The economy would come back. The businessmen in the audience, like the Resnicks, you will understand this. The, the economy comes back. You say, OK, people are buying stuff. Let's make more stuff. And then they start hiring. There's about a six-month delay. 1990, recession. The recovery uh, happens, the economy comes back, and the jobs come back not six months later, but 15 months later. The recession of the early 2000s, the economy comes back, and the jobs come back not six months later, not 15 months later, but 29 months later. The recession of 2007 and 8, the last one, the economy comes back, and then the jobs come back not six months later, not 15 months later, not 29 months later, 64 months later. So what happened around 1990 is we broke the connection between the economy and jobs, between capital and labor. So if you are a big American company, if you're a big American hedge fund, if, you're, if you have pools of capital and technological expertise and highly skilled workers, what you can do is you surf this amazing new world that I've just described. You find a place where there's cheap capital. You find a place where there's cheap labor. You find a place where there are growing markets. And you perform a kind of global arbitrage, and it's fantastic. But what if you're a steel worker in Pennsylvania? What if you're a coal miner in West Virginia? What if you're doing agriculture in Ohio? These forces that I've been describing, technology and globalization, are acting as a pincer movement on you. They're depressing your wages, because everything you do can be done by somebody in China or by a, a machine. And we talk a lot about 
the Chinas of the world and the Mexicos, but the real story here is, of course, technology. So if you just think about not what has happened, but what is likely to happen, right? One of the things we've heard a lot about is the extraordinary rise of uh, driverless vehicles that we're going, we going to see, which is amazing. I mean, I think the technology is really e extraordinary based on this kind of computing power and, and, and uh, data, the ability to analyze everything. 20 years from now, we might look back and think, how did we ever allow human beings to do something as dangerous as drive a car? Because, you know, think about it. The machine will never be drunk. The machine will never take the wrong turn. The machine will never find it too rainy or slow or, or snowy. The, the machine will never have to turn around and talk to his or her kids. Um, so all those things that cause enormous, uh, you know, hardship. By the way, you're talking about 40,000 people dying on American highways. All that goes away. But here's the, the other side to it. Three and a half million Americans drive a car, bus, or truck for a living. This is the single most widely held occupation for men in the United States. It is overwhelmingly held by men without college degrees. And these are overwhelmingly older people. So what you are doing, what this disruption will do, is to put out of work or more likely depress the wages of people who are 50 odd years old uh, without a college education. And now you're going to say to them, great, let's retrain you to be a software engineer. right?" That's, that's the nature of this problem. Think of an, another one, um, retail. So we, we, all, you know, we all know how much we shop online and how, as a result of it, we shop less at stores. Well, what has that done? Across the United States, there was a whole universe of mom and pop shops that existed. Right? And these were, again, think about the kind of person who runs those mom and pop. Not generally college educated, hard working, a little entrepreneurial, um, were able to make a go of some little hardware store, some little bookstore, whatever it was. And at the end of the day, when, you, when, when that economy goes away, when the, when, the, when the business goes away, what also happens is the community begins to collapse because those stores were also civic meeting points. You know, the malls that are now disappearing because their anchor shops are going away were the places where people would meet. And it's where maybe the local Rotary Club or Kiwani Club or, or Elks would, would meet. And all those people who were involved in them would be, would be sharing in the civic com and communal life of these places. So it's not just an economic trend. It's a, it's a social trend that's taken place. And that is the economic engine that we've been watching that you have now heard so much about. Uh, and, and it is, in some ways, the kind of great underlying force here that we have to, that we have to talk about, and that is you know, the, 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 the underlying engine that has produced the kind of populism we are seeing and the rise of people like Donald Trump. But there's an interesting puzzle. Trump certainly thinks that he is a unique phenomenon, and in many ways, he really is unique um, in terms of when you look at populism around the world, uh, the flexibility with the facts, the celebrity status, all that, that's, that, that is not something you see everywhere else. But what is interesting is, of course, this is a wave of populism taking place around the world. It's not just the United States. But we have to unpack that for a minute and ask ourselves where it's happening, because it's actually very interesting. The, the heart of populism used to be Latin America. If you went back 30 or 40 years and you ask yourself, where would you see the great populist regimes? They were all in Argentina and, and, and Bolivia and Brazil. That was what people, that's really what defined modern populism. Latin America has almost no populism. Latin America is, an, in, is, is a country filled with pragmatic, reform-minded, uh, you know, Hillary, Hillary Clinton-like policy wonks who are trying to integrate their economies into the globe. You think about Mexico, you think of Brazil, you think of Argentina. Um, that is the, 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 the drive. You've got one uh, kind of quasi-dictatorial populist in Venezuela and one ancient regime in Cuba. But other than that, what's extraordinary is how much Latin America is looking more and more modern in that sense. You look at Asia. In Asia, you have, in India, Prime Minister Modi was just here to, to visit Trump, pragmatic, business-oriented market reformer. Indonesia, largest Muslim country in the world, has a businessman turned mayor turned uh, president, again, pragmatic reformer. China, even Japan, to the extent that the Japanese have real reformers, this prime minister has been more reform-minded than almost any. Very little populism of the kind we're talking about. So where do you see it? 
Well, you see it in the Western world. You see it in Europe and the United States. And the question even there becomes more interesting, which is that you actually see it in places that are very different economically. So I just gave you the story of the loss of manufacturing. Well, guess which country has not lost that much manufacturing? It's lost a little, but not a lot, Germany. And guess what? Germany has right-wing populism growing as well. You talk about rising inequality in the United States, which is a huge problem. But guess what? Holland, Denmark, Sweden, they have not had much rising inequality in the last 20 years. And they have right -wing, fiery right-wing populace. So what do all these people have in common? The one word I would give you is immigrants, right? This is the one common feature of all countries that have populism. Now, I want to be clear. That's not the only thing. This is too complex a phenomenon to have one cause. But the way I would put it is the economic stagnation and difficulty has, led rise, has given rise to a kind of cultural anxiety about people's place in the world. So there's very good data now on, on, after the elections. It tries to figure out what is the single best predictor of a Trump voter, of somebody who would vote for Donald Trump, in terms of the, the survey data they answered. And the single best predictor is cultural anxiety that my country is changing. The second is a desire to keep immigrants out. Um, and the third was uh, uh, about a, um, a language, I think. When you ask people, is it that your economic circumstances have changed, uh, the people who felt that the economic circumstances had gotten worse actually slightly preferred Hillary Clinton. Um, it was essentially statistically not, 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 not that different. But the, the engine, the, the, the motor that was, that was uh, propelling people toward Donald Trump had much more to do with these issues of culture. And Trump, by the way, understood this very well. Um, if you think about Trump is often talk, talked about as kind of crazy and chaotic on the campaign trail. Actually, he wasn't. There was a certain kind of entertainment reality TV shtick that he did. But he was remarkably consistent in his core message. And his core message was actually fundamentally not about economics. His core message to people was, your life sucks. It's because of Mexicans, Chinese people, and Muslims. The Mexicans take your jobs. The Chinese people take your factories. The Muslims threaten your lives. I'm going to beat them all up. You're going to be great again. That's one hour in two sentences, OK? Um, but, but that was really the, the, the message. And what Trump understood, and he's a good salesman, and like any good salesman, you go into these audiences and you understand what they want to hear. He understood what people wanted. He read the Republican base correctly, and 16 other Republican candidates didn't. You remember the second debate, somebody asked, um, will you cut Social Security and Medicare? And of course, the conventional wisdom in Washington and for Republican establishment is the way that you show you're a man is that you're willing to cut entitlements. So one after the other, they all say, yes, we'll cut entitlements, we'll cut entitlements. It comes to Trump. And he says, no, I'm not going to touch Social Security and Medicare. He understood, maybe because he went out there, maybe because he was a good salesman, that the base of the Republican Party was different. They were not that interested in entitlement reform and getting rid of the carrot interest. And they, they didn't understand any of it. What they wanted to hear was this raw message of cultural anxiety, cultural affirmation, and a sense that he connected with them. And that's, that, that's another part of this populist puzzle that I think is very important to talk about. Um, there's a very good Harvard Business Review article that pointed out that working class people actually like rich people a lot because they want to be like them. And they fantasize that that's what they would be like if they were really rich. You know, if, if you think about the photographs we've seen of the inside of Trump Tower, his apartment, that is basically a working class person's fantasy of how you would live if you, if you hit the, the, the jackpot, right? Or, or, or how you, or the, the suite you would, you would book in Vegas if, you, if, you, if you, somebody gave you five grand, right? And that is, that is how they think about the rich. The people they really don't like are all of you, professionals. <laughs> they despise professionals because they regard them as coming from a different world. These are overeducated people who like to live in urban areas, who have very bizarre food tastes like arugula and kale, uh, <laughs> organic food, who engage in strange you know, practices that seem to them almost like witchcraft, like yoga and Pilates, right? Um, I, I, I hope I'm not hitting too close to home here. Um, 
and they don't fundamentally understand what we do anyway. You're, you're all manipulating words, numbers, symbols, like you know, lawyers, consultants, media people. What do you actually do? But a guy who builds a building, right? And that's that that, that stuff. And then you know, he he spends the money the way they they fantasize about spending it. Trump had once on his Instagram a photograph of him in his jet with the gold uh, buckles. Uh, <laughs> and a big bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? And the message he's sending is, I'm just like you, only richer, right? If you, were, if you were rich like me, you'd own a private plane, but you'd still eat Kentucky Fried Chicken. This has been the great challenge for the Democratic Party. The Democrats are constantly worried about, are we left enough, right enough? Do we have the right single payer plan? Should we? First of all, the public doesn't vote on that basis. This is now, there's over mountains of research in social science that's true. The public votes from its gut. It's not evaluating these programs. And by the way, on economics, the public generally likes the Democrats more. You know, 50, I think 51% of Trump voters support a $15, a $15 minimum wage. So what this, is, this is all about some kind of sense of cultural connection. Do you know me? Do you understand me? And you know, in many ways, the, the, the last Democrat who had that ability was Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton was able to, you know, people from that world felt like he knows me, I, I know him. And by the way, it's not an accident that in his two most visceral tastes, food and women, Bill Clinton did not stray very far from rural Arkansas, right? <laughs> um, and and that, that, that I, I, I know this is being recorded, and I hope I don't get into trouble with it. But, um, but, the, but, but I'm, what I'm trying to get at is it's very visceral. It's very much at the sense of, do, does, do you know me? Because people are searching for the sense of being, of being known, being seen, being identified. And I think that they feel that the modern Democratic Party is just a party of fancy professionals who know better, who have, have all these uh, Ivy League degrees and facts at their disposal, and that they use them as cudgels to, uh, to, you know, to, to condescend and, and, and keep down ordinary people. And that, that, I think, is at the heart of this, so this very pernicious, obviously, I think, suspicion of facts, is this feeling that we are always inherently at a disadvantage if the debate is all going to be about facts and knowledge and all that, because you guys are always going to be able to outsmart us at it. Um, and so, when you look at that, the, the, the world the way I've described it, the question becomes, what does one do about it? Right? Um, I think that some piece of this is that you have to recognize the economic reality that I was, just, was describing. And I think we have not, as a, as a country, really t come to grips with it. Uh, it is, I think, something that's happening on a much bigger scale and a much wider scale than we realize. It has these economic and social dimensions. I think we need to think much bigger and more creatively about, about how, to, uh, how to tackle it. I'll give you one example. Um, I think that when we think about retraining, you know, we all like the idea, but here's the thing. And then we look at Germany. Even Trump said to Merkel before he presented her with a $2 trillion bill for having, you know, for, for, because America has defended Germany for the last 75 years, and he apparently put compound interest on it. Um, <laughs> If before that, he says, so I would really admire your apprenticeship systems, your retraining. So, you know, the Germans do this stuff really amazingly. And we think, oh, it must be the Germans. There's some kind of great gene that they have. You know, you tend to have this feeling with Germans. They can kind of make, they almost made communism work. If you ever went to East, East Germany, it was like uncanny how it was much more efficient than any other communist country in the world. But uh, the real reason why German retraining works is because, roughly speaking, they spend 15 times as much on retraining as we do. Um, in a, by the way, in a country of 90 million people. I'm not equalizing this. So you, you, literally, we'd be talking about spending 30 times, 40 times as much as we're currently spending on it. So we always look to do this stuff, but then we want to do it on the cheap. So Donald Trump's $1 trillion infrastructure plan, which I totally support, in theory, turned out to be a $200 million program of tax credits for companies to build infrastructure they were going to build anywhere over 10 years. It's like, you know, you can't, if you want to do this, it's going to cost money, right? And, and there's, no, there's no way to, they, conservatives like to say there's no free lunch. Well, there are no free highways either. There's no free train stations. There are no free airports. You've got to build this stuff. And if you want to do retraining, I would suggest we need to think on the terms of something like a, 
you know, a a, 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 an idea that every American who is displaced either because of trade or technology at any point in their lives can go and get three to six months of retraining at a local community college of their choice. This would be paid for by the federal government. The local industry would identify the needs. You know, why right now we need welders, right now we need uh, uh, retrofitters, whatever it is. And the federal government would pay for it. Uh, it would be on the scale of the GI Bill. But I think you need to do something like that that really is much bigger and more ambitious than anything we've done since the days of the, of the, of the New Deal and the, and, the, and the GI Bill. But if we don't do something like that, we will, we will find that there is no hope for these groups. Because you know what? This, this, these mechanisms I've been describing are only getting more and more. Uh, they're getting worse. The divisions are getting greater. So I talk to people in Ohio, and they, they point out that even the smart kids in Ohio, they want to go to Chicago. They want to go to San Francisco. They want to go to New York. They want to go to. So what you're left behind with are people who are not as easy to, to, to train to be software engineers. You know, you end up with a rural community that wants to live a quieter rural life, which is great. But there has to be some way that you, that you find a, 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 and create an economy that works for them. But I think we also have to deal with the cultural issues. And this is the hard part for the left in general. You know, that's why, we all, that's why we like to have the Sanders versus Larry Summers debate. Um, because what, how does the left recognize the reality that the country is not quite where it is on some of these cultural issues? So take immigration, for example. The, the reality of immigration is that there has been a lot. In 1970, the number of foreign-born Americans was 4.5% of the population. Today, it's 14.5%. The, the shift in Europe is about as large. This is be largely a result of the, the changing of the caps in 1965, which began this wave. That's a lot. That's a lot for people to digest. Put it in historical perspective. For most of human history, I mean 99% of human history, people grew up, worked, grew old, and died within one mile of where they were born. Right? And in the last 35 years, you've had 750 million people leave their countries to move to an entirely different country, often thousands of miles away. That is a lot of cultural change to absorb. And I think that we have to recognize that there is a reality to that, that that does have a cultural effect. For example, you know, uh, my old mentor, Sam Huntington, at Harvard wrote a book in which he talked about how Mexican immigration was qualitatively different from others because it was so con close. It was contiguous. There were, it was so large. And there was this ability to go back and forth and create communities within the United States. So you really didn't have to assimilate. And he pointed out using very good data how that was actually uh, you know, genuinely a, a, a break from past uh, immigration waves. He was derided as a racist on the left. We've got to find a way to talk about these issues without speaking them, about them exactly that way. Um, you know, even with regard to issues relating to things like sexual orientation, where I think that the left in the United States has played a heroic role in providing uh, greater equity to people. Maybe there is some space to understand that the rest of the country is not exactly where you are on something like transgendered bathrooms. You know, so California uh, have put in this place this travel ban, where you literally, the state will withdraw funding from you if you dare to travel to a repressive, uh, you know, uh, horrendous backward reactionary place like North Carolina or Texas. And now, meanwhile, as far as I know, you can travel to Saudi Arabia on the, on the, on the you know, California government's dime, but you can't go to Texas because they don't have transgender bathrooms. I'm exaggerating somewhat, but my point is, you know, we've got to recognize that, the, you know, that societies move slowly and that there has to be some, not accommodation on principle maybe, but accommodation to the reality that people uh, are at different stages on some of these issues. That, I think, is the much harder piece for us to figure out how to deal with. Um, let me close on a note of hope. You know, I talked about how this is happening all over the world. The one country in which it is not happening is Canada. Um, Canada is the one Western country that basically has no right-wing populism. Now, why is that? Is it just the Canadians are kind of nicer people in general, and the populism is kind of has a mean connotation, and they don't want to be mean? Uh, no. It turns out that Canada actually had many problems with all this kind of stuff. They used to have a very pretty nasty whites-only immigration policy until the 1970s. And then Pierre Trudeau, the father of the current prime minister, comes in, and he changes it for two reasons. 
One, because Canada is going through this death struggle between the Francophone Canada and Anglophone Canada. And he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to change the debate by having a multicultural Canada, by allowing immigrants to come in from countries hitherto not allowed. And now the sources of Canadian identity become more complicated in many than whether you're French or English or you come from India. You know, so it's a very clever political solution to a problem. It, it, it produced this enormous demographic dividend for, China, for Canada. Uh, it allowed them to do this merit-based immigration that Trump loves, where you, 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 know, you bring in smart people, uh, which is fine, except you know, you're not always quite sure who smart people are. And uh, smart people are not always the best businessmen. Some of the best businessmen in the world have just been people who have commercial savvy. And it's not always easy to tell who those people are. And by the way, the Mexican dry clean, you know, dishwasher might turn out to have that drive and that gumption that makes that possible. But in general, what Canada has been able to do is have good public policy. You know, good public policy that addresses issues like inequality. That, you know, I think Canadian healthcare is a huge advantage because it doesn't leave people anxious about what is going to happen to them if they leave, they've changed their jobs, they change their employers, they, they, they get old, they, they get sick, none of that, right? So you have this, this anchor of stability. Um, you have a more generous, uh, um, um, welfare state, but one that's pretty geared towards trying to make sure that you get a job. Uh, and fundamentally, perhaps, the, the parties have been willing to defend many of these principles. So, you know, Justin Trudeau uh, is, is willing to go out not just and march in gay pride uh, parades, but also to march on, uh, on Eid and say Eid Mubarak to C Canadian Muslims. Uh, it's that ability to say, you know, we stand for something, we're proud of it, we understand that others are, are not exactly there. But if you can have that positive, dynamic, optimistic message, I think it makes a big difference. Remember, when you, when you despair about these waves of populism, that if the vote had been held uh, for under 40-year-olds, I think Donald Trump came in third after Gary Johnson. I think if it was under 30-year-olds, he came in fourth under Jill, uh, after Jill Stein. So the reality is that the, the younger generation want a world in which they can be connected to the rest of the world. They want an economy in which is diverse and flexible and open uh, and technologically advanced. They want a society that is diverse and pluralistic and multicultural. They want it because they understand it enriches them economically, politically, socially, in every sense. So I think we're going to be fine. Uh, I think particularly when these young people get into positions of power, we will really be fine. Our great trick is to how to make sure we don't blow up the world between now and then. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Questions, comments? You can disagree with me, but it has to be in the form of a short question. Hi. Um, I was wondering how you uh, personally take some of the attacks at the right wing has leveled on you. One that sticks in my mind is Ann Coulter deriding your accent uh, as you talked about Americanism uh, via Twitter, which I think set the Twitter world ablaze. And I was wondering how you personally deal with this as, a, as an American. Yeah, what she said, what she tweeted was, just what we need, another angry Muslim guy with a thick Indian accent or something like that. <laughs> To which my, my primary uh, 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 reaction was, she obviously has not hung around Indians. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I can do a proper Indian accent, but that is not, you know. <laughs> um, so so I, I, I think that, uh, you, you know, the, the, the truth of the matter is, I, I, I will tell you this. I've been stunned by the degree to which, um, you know, the kind of outpouring of hate over the last, really, year. So my Twitter feed was probably like 2% racist, I'm racist, bigoted, you know, kind of go back to India, you da da da, go back to, they, they, half the time they don't know where I'm from, so it's like India, Egypt, Indonesia, whatever, <laughs> um, they, they all sound the same. Um, and, and very, you know, often very colorful language. So that'd be about 2%. In the last year, it's gone up to, I'd say about 20%, 25%. I mean, it's really extraordinary. And, you know, it's, it's really pretty nasty stuff. Um, to me, the more interesting one has been the rise of anti-Semitism. Because I think there's absolutely no question, if you talk to Jewish community centers everywhere in the country, they'll tell you they have experienced more threats, more attacks, more phone calls. 
And there's no question in my mind that Donald Trump is not an anti, he, Donald Trump, I should be clear, is not an anti-Semite. I think he would be you know, perplexed by this. It does in no way intended it. But what it shows you is, if you encourage a certain kind of language and behavior, and if you encourage a certain kind of intolerance, well, guess what? You're giving permission to all the crazies. You know, and their, their, their particular intolerances might not be yours. But what you've just done is you've opened up a Pandora's box, and you've given a green light to people. So to me, that's been the most, in, in some ways, disheartening piece of it, to see you know, you know, something like anti-Semitism in America. You always thought it was something that was you know, just steadily on the decline. And to see this uh, really ugly resurgence of it, and, and coming from unexpected sources, uh, I think it's very sad. What do I do with it personally? Uh, you know, like I, I, I would be lying to you if I didn't, uh, if I told you it doesn't affect me. Of course, it affects you. Um, you know, I've done this now for 25 years. You develop thicker skin every year, um, and you, you know, you have fewer wo worries. I've, I had a few over the last year because they, some people reviewed, some of them tweeted out my address, some of them called home, talked to my uh, daughters who are uh, nine and 14, and that's tough. But uh, you know, you just you you, you keep the, there was an a, a, an Islamic uh, mullah who issued a fatwa against me right after 9/11 because I wrote a pretty tough piece on the state of the Muslim world and why they needed to reform. Um, and for a while, I was at Newsweek at the time. Everybody was very worried, and then I called up a friend of mine who was in the administration at the time, and you know, he said to me, "Here are the precautions you should take." Here's the guy, the FBI, who's going to get in touch with you. And then he said to me, but you know what, For it, relax. You're not that important. They issue five of these a day. <laughs> they, <you know. laughs> so, um, ma'am. Um, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about this administration. And um, one of the questions that I have is, are the networks in general, like CNN, are, are you... Being, are the networks being threatened in any way to not speak their mind, not keep doing what you're doing? Yes, without, without any question, and to an unprecedented degree, in a way that no, no president has ever done before. I mean, and this is not some private matter, it's a matter of public record. The president of the United States called in the heads of all the networks and spent an hour and a half berating them for not covering him more favorably in a way that is, you know, I mean, Nixon in his darkest hour would not have dared to do something like that. He, he tweets every day that these, these, you know, these organizations are bogus, should go bankrupt, uh, and he has repeatedly publicly said that he does not think that the Justice Department should approve the AT&T merger of, uh, with, with Time Warner because uh, CNN is involved. I think like much of what Trump, Trump says, it's, you know, it's hot air, it won't mean anything, but it's certainly, you know, you, it's just I, all I can say is as somebody who works there, you kind of watch it and think to yourself, okay, I hope this is all okay, as somebody who said some things uh, that are, have been pretty tough on Trump. Uh, yeah, it's very, it's very disconcerting. I, we've never had a situation like that. And not just that, you have the president talking about how he wants to wonder if there's a way to change the laws so that you can, so that you, you know, you can sue journalists. You know, I don't know if he understands that it's actually the First Amendment, and you, you, you can't just change the law. But, um, you know, so, so yes, I mean, I think that we're all, look, I think the good news story here is that two institutions in America have, have held up pretty well. American courts have responded in, in a very independent fashion and have not allowed themselves to be bullied, even when individual judges have been demeaned by name, individual circuits have been demeaned, and the press has, has generally tried to continue to do its job. But um, yeah, the, yeah there's, there, there's a, you have a real sense of, this, of pressure, you have a real sense of being, uh, of being on guard, you know, watching for yourself for any small, tiny slip. You know, remember, these are large organizations. Somebody somewhere is doing something wrong, probably at any given moment. Um, and so, you, yeah, yeah, there is a, I, I, I think Jeff Zucker has one of the hardest jobs in America right now because you have not just this whole legions of, of people, you know, watch groups looking at him, but you have an administration that will actively foment and encourage that kind of, uh, that kind of attitude. And to be trying to do your job in that circumstance, is, it's very tough. Um, Ma'am. Thank you for all you do for educating us and taking the risks you take. My question is, 
What would you say to the baggage claim guy in Boston, Massachusetts at United Airlines, who has been a lifelong Democrat, ha happened to be an immigrant, works so many hours a day, doesn't get health insurance, and then says he three nights a week he has to work from 11 to 6 in the morning at one of the local hospitals so that he can provide insurance for his kids. And when he works at night, he sees immigrants coming in, having babies, and being free serviced. I didn't know what to say to him. What would you say to him? So I think that the fundamental piece of this that you have to try to address, it seems to me, is his economic anxiety, right? If he had, if he had guaranteed health care uh, and didn't have to do that, all that, one wonders whether he would take such a sharp and dyspeptic look at the, you know, it's easy to blame somebody when you feel, when you, when you feel the pain, but if you're not feeling as much pain, maybe you won't be as prone to as quickly blame, blame somebody. But as I say, I think we have to recognize that, you know, low-skilled uh, low immigration has had an impact on the wages of the lowest-skilled Americans. And what that means, I think, is you do have to be careful about how many you take in. You do have to be you know, tough on, on, on illegal immigration. But you also have to really work on making the lives of those low-skilled Americans. Uh, you know, I, I think, again, here, one of the problems the Democratic Party has, it tends just to, to project this idea that the best thing anyone could do is to go and get a college degree, and then your life will be fine, which is great. And I'm sure you know, all of you feel that way, but keep this in mind. 70% of Americans don't have a college degree. The most, com frequent, the most common job in America does not require a, com a, a college degree. So what are you saying to those people? Are you saying to them your life is a failure? Are you saying to them you can never move up the escalator of opportunity? No, there are lots of industries in which there are many, many opportunities. And maybe we need to highlight that more. I'll give you one simple example, hospitality. It's a great industry where you can start as a bellboy and become a general manager of a hotel um, you know, with, with virtually no, almost all on the job training. I think we need to think about, we, our public policy has tended to think just about GDP growth, the raw number. And I think we need to start thinking about the quality and nature of that growth, particularly what does it do to help the most, you know, the people with the lowest skills. How does it, how does it work for them? Because clearly the market left to its own devices is going to be fantastic for everyone in this room. But it's really not working for people with very low skills. Um, and what do you do about that? That's, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's beyond just government policy. Like people talk about a universal basic income. I don't know that that would work. I think people want the dignity of having a job. I think they want that sense. It, it also regulates your life. It gives you uh, some kind of a, uh, an identity. You know, you are that person. Uh, and I hate to put it in purely uh, uh, these terms, but I think it's more, more true for men than women, because men have, kind of frankly, more limited lives. In many ways, women are more social creatures and are able to have identities that are rooted in community and family and things. For men, you know, you, you see men at a dinner party, it's like, what do you do, what do you do, what do you do, what do you do, what do you do? <laughs> if, you didn't have that, if you didn't have that question, a man wouldn't know what to do at a dinner party. <laughs> so. You mentioned the more xenophobic and nationalist populism that rose in the last election, but you didn't really touch on the progressive or liberal populism of Bernie Sanders. And is that movement dead because he did not get the nomination? Is that still a force that you see in upcoming elections? And just demographically, as millennials you know, become the next big generation, you know, what force will progressive populism have in the country? So I have a slightly unorthodox take on Sanders' candidacy. I don't think that what people loved about Bernie Sanders was the, you know, the kind of democratic socialism. I think that to the extent that they understood it, they didn't quite understand the math is very hard to make work. I mean, I appreciate a number of the things he said. They're just wildly unaffordable. It'd be very difficult to do. I think you know, in office, he would have found that, by the way. I think there's no chance most of those proposals would have happened. And you know, Hillary's much more careful, cost-effective cost ones probably were the more likely ones, particularly to go through a Republican Congress. I think what people liked about Bernie Sanders was that he was authentic, that we are living in an age of 
totally programmed politics and politicians who literally poll test and focus group every word that they say, every sweater that they wear. And I have this guy who's like this 70-year-old you know, curmudgeon Jewish socialist who is more than willing to explain that he's sort of an agnostic, sort of a socialist, not really a Democrat. It's like in, in his own way, he was, he was doing what Trump was doing, right? He was breaking all the rules, and people were, were saying to themselves, thank God, somebody who's actually letting us in on who they really are. I think that the next person who's going to succeed, if I may be wrong about this, but will have to have that element of authenticity. It's much more about that than about the particular program that you put forward. Look, all these guys who are crazy about Bernie Sanders then line up to go and you know, interview with Goldman Sachs the next morning for their colleges. So I don't think these are kind of deeply anti-capitalist people, right? These are people who are searching for something that felt real. And, and he is. Well, he is the real deal. Last one, sir. People seem to want to get along for at least a brief period of time. Now we're in a different time. You talked about that maybe 2% of your Twitter comments were negative. Now it's 20%. Is this going to continue for the rest of our lives into our future, or do you see a way that this can change? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question because I fear that what is happening is we have, we have segregated ourselves politically, so we live with the people who we agree with politically, we go to school with the people we agree with politically, we talk to the people we, we agree with politically, we watch the news delivered by people who we agree with politically. And as a result of that, we live in these, these, these cocoons where it's very easy to, um, to look down on and to caricature the other. It becomes a, it becomes a very simple device. Uh, and it's by, 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 true on both sides. And so the question is, you know, how do you change that? Because what's happened is political identity has now become an outgrowth of socioeconomic identity. Uh, the single most powerful predictor of whether or not you were voting Republican or Democrat in the last election was whether you had a college degree. The second most powerful predictor was whether you lived in a rural area or urban area. So think about that. What you're talking about are these, these groups that have kind of isolated themselves and now think of themselves in ways that are very difficult to bridge. So when economic identity was at the heart of, of, of uh, politics, when, you know, if you were poor and working class, you voted left of center. If you were professional or, or rich, you were right of center. In England, in the United States, that was simple, right? You could split the difference. Economic identity is easy to split the difference on. You want to spend $100 billion, I want to spend zero. There's a, there's a number in between. You want to cut taxes by 10%, I want to cut them to zero. There's a number in between. The problem with identity as cultural artifact is it's very hard to compromise because they each, they, they seem deep, character-defining, nation-defining issues, right? Think about abortion, same-sex marriage, uh, immigration, which is, a, which is really a, a proxy for national identity, religion, uh, things like that. These are all very difficult things to compromise on. We've almost become Shiites and Sunnis, right? Where we look at each other and we say, well, I can't compromise on this issue because that would be to, that would be to accept a completely different America than I want, and, and, and that, just can't happen. So I look at that, and I, you know, honestly, this is the part that, uh, that, makes, that, that makes me very sad, because I don't quite see. There are many of the, uh, these other areas I see paths out. You know, the, the United States has lots of economic problems. It has lots of uh, social problems. But it has enormous strengths. You know, if you were looking at any other country in the world, you'd kill to have these strengths. And so you have these strengths. You can, you, you know, problems have solutions. But you have to have people of goodwill who are willing to come together and to start working to make that happen. And that's the piece that we're missing right now. But look, I'm an immigrant, and I still tend to look at the, the glass very much half full. I am very conscious of the fact that not only is my Twitter feed 80% positive, but that Twitter is very unrepresentative. And that by and large, in the you know, 35 years I've been in this country, I have only had extraordinary hospitality uh, and friendship and kindness, uh, and I'm sure that that's been the experience of most immigrants. And I think that you have to you have to feel that we have to bet on the country. You know, you you can't get yourself down too much because uh, at the end of the day, 
this still is an extraordinary, unique place. You know, there are other places copying various parts of American public policy, and they, they tweak with this or that. I don't know. I travel a lot around the world. There still is no place in the world where people can, can, can go to and really try to make themselves anew and to make something of themselves, and that the society will encourage it, the country will encourage it, uh, people will celebrate you for it, and really people do care more about your destination and your, than your origins. I think, look, the litmus test is, do I think if I were 18 years old and I had a choice, would I still make that journey? Uh, which is a difficult one. You're leaving behind your, your family, your country, your culture, um, and I think I would. So I still, I still I, I am very hopeful about America. Thank you all very much. Thank you.